So this message will be a little bit shorter, but I think the service is still going to go a little bit longer because it's such a beautiful, special day. Uh, well, again, grace and peace to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Two years ago, this exact weekend, as a matter of fact, we looked at the very same passage that we are looking at today from our very first lesson, a sermon that I had titled, I Was Blind, But Now I See. I don't expect you to remember it because I don't either. But today we're taking a kind of a different view of that very same passage, focusing on one aspect of the story. And so to do that, we are going to start where the story ends. And that's with Saul's baptism. To do that, we go back to the lesson that we just heard, and we read a small portion of that, verses 17 through 19, which reads this. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up, and he was baptized, and afterwards he ate some food, and he regained his strength. Right there, verse 18, it, it says that Saul arose and was baptized. Anybody ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? It's a great comedy, right? And there's a patriarch in the family by the name of Gus. And Gus is Greek. And Gus says this, The word baptismo comes from the Greek word baptisme, which means we dip the little baby in the silver basin. Kind of like we did just a few minutes ago, right? But in all seriousness, the, ver the verb here that we see here in verse 18, a bismisme, a form of baptismo, right? The meaning was baptized. It means an act of being washed, of being cleansed, of purification by dipping or plunging. The verb in Greek indicates that Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, was a passive participant, meaning the action is all done unto him. He was made complete and purified of all of his sins, not by anything that Ananias had done, not by anything that Saul had done, but completely and 1,000% by the Lord. And as it was for Paul, who was Saul, it is for you as well. As Lutherans, we understand baptism to be a sacrament, an act of divine institution, one of two, the other one being the Holy Eucharist or communion, which we're going to celebrate in a number of minutes. And a sacrament is something that God does unto us. It's a, a work or action not of our own making but something, again, that's happening to us by the Lord. It's an act of, well, divine promise. It's like heaven pursuing you, if you will. Kind of the purest and oldest understanding of baptism is that it's God's act of saving grace. One that really has absolutely nothing to do with our own thoughts, our own feelings, any work or any decision of our own choosing. Again, it's 100% on God, by God, for you. I don't know who said this. I couldn't find the quote attribution, but I think it's worth remembering. Baptism is not a mere ritual or a symbol, but a powerful means of grace by which God grants faith and the forgiveness of sins. The Apostle Peter said this, and as Lutherans, we hold to this strongly. Water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you. Not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. In Paul's case, his being baptized 
was an outward expression of his faith for the manner in which God had already chosen him. How God had already pursued him and saved him with zero action being done by Saul. Saul didn't come to God with a repentant heart. Yet God chased after him anyway to initiate the repentance that God was bestowing onto Saul in the act of present. Saul's being baptized signified that he had already been saved by the Lord. Again, not by his own choice, not because he was humble before God, and not because he chose to follow Jesus, but because God first chose Saul through divine election. For Emerson, for Sailor, for Breyer. In our minds, right, their moms and dads made the decision to have their children baptized. We do that as parents, as grandparents. We make the choice, we make the decision, I want to have my parent, my, my child baptized, or I want to be baptized, right? Sometimes adults are baptized, or older children are baptized in other faith traditions and even within the Lutheran church. In our minds, we're the ones making the decision. We're the ones choosing. But the decision really isn't ours. The decision is really God's. The parent's response, your all's response, right, is a pledge to raise these beautiful children, all of our children, to help support and encourage one another, to live in the ways of Jesus Christ, because the Lord had already imparted upon them that same promise of salvation to Emerson, to Sailor, and to Brayer that he had previously pledged in them in his divine grace, one that the Lord initiated in his own perfect time before we ever even understood it. To say it more simply, this was God's own acting. This was God's own choosing. This was own God's electing. Choosing first Anna and Jalen and Carly and Chad, and Alex and Reagan, and now also their children. This was God taking action, an action of election. And I would dare even say saving them before they were ever even conceived with no action required on their own behalf. As a mind trip as that could be. Martin Luther wrote this. On this promise depends on our whole salvation. On this promise of baptism, he's saying. And we must take heed to exercise that faith in it, not doubting at all that we are saved since we have been baptized. Other Christians believe differently. Other faith groups, other Christian faith groups believe differently. Some see baptism as an outward act or a symbol of them choosing God after first seeking the Lord with a repentant heart. My wife, who's there in the back booth, was baptized not as an infant, but as a younger child. Because in her faith system that she was raised in the Baptist church, you first choose God and then you're baptized. But in the Lutheran understanding of things, we believe that God first chose us. He chose you first and then we baptize as a reflection of that. And then faith there follows. We see baptism as a divine promise of salvation, as if the Lord has been perpetually pursuing us in order to justify us through Jesus Christ. For it is not, again, who we do the choosing, but it is all in the Lord. I want you to think of it like this. We're going to go back now to the very first verse in this passage of Acts chapter 9. And we hear this. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest to request letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation to arrest any of the followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Here we have Saul in hot pursuit of anyone following Jesus and hell-bent on destroying the church. 
Saul was the one doing the initiating. This was a done God. This was in his own flesh. He was seeking license to pursue, arrest, and destroy. But unknown to Saul at the time, God was in hot pursuit of him, initiating the events of his salvation because he had already chosen to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Luke continued writing this, verses 3 through 9. We hear, As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. The voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. God was chasing after Saul. God shone his light down onto Saul to bring him out of the darkness of his heart. And in that moment, the divine Logos, the word of God, Jesus Christ himself revealed himself to Saul and spoke to him saying, Why are you persecuting me? Jesus revealed himself through the word of God as he does for all of us through the word of God, through the Bible. And in all of this, the Lord our God calls Saul's temporary blindness to serve as an outward expression, if you will, of his already inward spiritual condition for his imprudent beliefs and his loathsome actions towards God's elect. But again, this is all on the Lord. This is all the Lord's doing, pursuing Paul so that he, Saul, excuse me, so that he could become Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. So that through his writings now, you and I, we can understand the depth of God's grace, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, and that unfathomable grace to save us from our spiritual blindness and the darkness of our own hearts and our sins. And as we heard in that first lesson, Saul arrived in Damascus, blinded and helpless, and God then initiated another event. He sent Ananias to minister to him, to pray to him, to lay hands on him, to attend him, and even baptize him. And again, the Lord is the one doing all the initiating. The Lord spoke to Ananias in a vision. He directed Ananias exactly where to go and exactly where to find Saul. God directed him to lay his hands upon Saul and upon his eyes, to pray for him, and then to baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and cleanse him from every sin in an act of divine grace and promise. Let's blind this bird, because here's what you need to know in all of this today. Your baptism... No matter how it occurred, whether from the time you were a wee little itty bitty baby and an infant or all the way up to an adult, your baptism is a reminder that the Lord pursued you and saved you by His grace before you could ever take action and respond in faith. Now faith as a response is still required of us all. But that faith even still is a gift. A gift with a response of God's promise to save us. This word that the Lord has given us by the writing of Luke reminds us how marvelous, how gracious our Lord is that He would cleanse us and that He would send heaven to pursue us. Yet we, while we were still sinners... To save us when we could do nothing to save ourselves from sin. And then he has sealed us with the same promise of his saving grace. And I say to that, to God be given all the glory. May heaven continue to pursue us until all of us have reached heaven's shores and basking in the glory of the Lord. Amen? Amen and amen. Let's stand up.
Let's sing.